Last week, we began our discussion on identity, and we were saying that our identity is obviously very important. It shapes the way that we see ourselves, the way that we see the world, even kind of the way that we feel about ourselves. Uh, and our identity ends up being a bit like the, a label that we wear, a label that we wear maybe willingly or unwillingly, maybe something happens to us, or people have given us a label, kind of like a bad nickname that sticks with us, but it can be much worse. It can be a label that we internalize about ourselves. So our labels can be something that we project to other people and we want to show a certain face. They can also be something that we wear internally, that we really believe deep down about ourselves, about who we are. Our labels can be conscious or unconscious. Uh, We maybe don't really realize that we are wearing this thing or, or having this be a part of us. But our identity is super important, and it is uh, going to end up affecting our relationship with everything else. We, uh, the question we asked ourselves last week was, well, how do we end up discovering our true identity? How, what is a way that we end up finding out who we are, and at different times and in different cultures, people have answered that question a little bit differently. Uh, that in some cultures, they look outward. They, they find their identity by looking outward to the group, to our family, to our culture, and they help to define who we are. We end up being a bit more like a crystal, that our place in society is a bit more fixed, but we kind of know where we belong. We know what's expected of us. In other cultures or other times, we would look inward. This is definitely a very American way of doing things. We are, uh, we have this score, there was, I listened to a, a, a program about the way that they talk about different cultures in the world and uh, what makes a culture a culture. And one of the six characteristics is whether we are very communal or whether we are very individualistic. And you may wonder where the U.S. fits in there. Uh, We are individualistic, but stand out from all other countries uh, as in our individualism, completely an outlier on individualism. And so we, as good individualists, often look inside. We say that the way that you find your truth is to look inside yourself. And but both of those things have their own problems, either looking out or looking in, looking out. We said last week that some of the problems that we have with that is if you get stuck in a place and if you are different than what other people want for you, then it's hard to break out of that. Uh, There are some limitations as well for looking inside that we don't look to some more communal wisdom about how we can live our life and to help other people. We thought about one of the limitations would be if somebody is a middle schooler, they don't have enough wisdom always to be able to know exactly who they are. They need some wisdom from other people. So what we said was the, the third option that we've got is for us to look up, to look up to God that God would be one who could help us to understand our identity, that we would be able to have God help shape that for us. The amazing part as we look up to God is that God brings in the best parts of looking out to somebody who's outside of us and looking in to truly know who we are, to be able to identify who we should be, what kind of label we would be proud to wear, a label that would be a blessing to us. And that's the beautiful part about looking up, is that God ends up making us more ourselves than we ever could be, but also frees us from some of the limitations of our own brokenness in ourselves and maybe some of the patterns that we have inherited from other people. Because you know what? God also brings healing. God brings restoration for those labels that have been put on us or have been inflicted upon us by other people or experiences, that that God is able to take away false labels from our people or circumstances that have been in our life. Because God's label is healing. It's restorative. And we talked last week that the true big label that God puts on us or in us is that every follower of Jesus has the living spirit of God in us that we have God indwelling us and filling us with his spirit. And and God had promised that throughout the Old Testament on individual people, but then had poured it out on other people in the beginning in Acts. Acts 2, we see that being poured out on people, that God's spirit comes. And we said, now we have God's presence with us, and, and God's spirit points us to Jesus, and he gives us his peace. 
that, that God is shaping us for his kingdom. Now, I don't know if you noticed it last week, but when we read our passage, we kind of breezed past some language that was there in John 14. And you know what? It wasn't a problem for a lot of people. I was kind of happy to kind of run past some things, but that really should catch us. And so what I want us to do is rewind a little bit on some of that passage that we read this last, last week in John 14. And I would like for us to look a little bit closer at that. So if you have a Bible or your app, open with me to John 14. We're going to be uh, looking around uh, the beginning in verse 15. So I don't know if you noticed it, but there's some striking language where Jesus says, he says, if you love me, then you will keep my commands. And he ends up having this be a kind of preface to the whole statement where he says, I'm going to give you my spirit. The spirit will be poured out on you. And this fullness that we talked about last week, well, the the whole kind of prerequisite or at least a, a connecting part of that, that's probably help better, a connecting part of that is that we would, if we would do his commands, that if we love him, we will do that. But I think it's pretty easy for us to happily read past that. We, we love the idea of God's love. But what he says is that this idea of keeping his commands is connected to that. That, that shouldn't shock us, that, that love should have to have some legs on it, that it should be able to be concrete, that we should be able to see it. That's what it looks like for us in our normal friendships, right? If somebody says that they're our friend, we, we want to see it. We want to see them act like a friend. Uh, same in our marriage relationships. You know, it, it doesn't matter how long somebody has been married or if they even just say that they love their spouse. Uh, ma- a real intimacy in marriage isn't measured by just the number of years together. It's measured by loving action. Does our action end up matching? Do we, do we see the substance to match the words. That's what we're asking ourselves. And so what Jesus is, Jesus is saying, he says, yeah, if you, if you call yourself one thing, you have to act like it. If you say you're in the army, but you don't follow orders, you're not much of a soldier. If you, uh, if, if your doctor says that they care for you, but they don't help you with any medicine, they're not acting like a doctor. And what Jesus is saying is that if you say you love me, but you don't do what I command, that's, you're not acting like a Christian. So uh, he, this is his own words. Let's listen to Jesus' own words. John 15, or sorry, John 14, beginning in verse 15. He says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, I appreciate that little, hey, just so you know, don't, don't freak out. This is, a, this is an okay guy, not the bad guy. Said, but Lord, why do you intend to show, us, uh, show yourself to us and not to the world? I think that's a fair question. Hey, what, what you, I thought that you were going to come back. This is going to be a bigger thing. Um, why would you just show yourself to us and not to everyone? Jesus replied, he kind of brushes it aside a little bit. He said, that'll be for later, but. Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them, the Father and Jesus, uh, and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So it's interesting, you know, there's a, the converse is true. Anyone who doesn't love me is not going to keep my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who, who sent me. So, If we want to wear the label of being a Christian, then we have to be able to say, hey, I want to be somebody who lovingly obeys God. Now, it doesn't have to necessarily be that we always do it, but we have to already have this disposition that we want to be somebody who obeys God, that we would do what he says. And we we can't separate those two things. That's what Jesus is saying. We can't separate 
loving him and seeking to obey him and to listen to him. And that's because ultimately, the mark of a true believer isn't really from the words that we say. It's not actually even totally from the things that we do. It's ultimately our heart allegiance. It's all about our heart allegiance. Who do we belong to? What is it, where does our heart belong? And if our heart is allied with God, if we have put ourselves in God's camp, that's ultimately the most important thing. And I think what Jesus is saying is that if our hearts are allied with God, if our heart allegiance is with him, then our words and our actions will follow. That's ultimately what is supposed to be happening here. So Jesus, he's, you know, it, so he's not taking a swipe at sentimental love that we, it's not saying that our feelings don't matter. That's really helpful to say. Our feelings do matter. Uh, it's not about that. But it's also not just about being good and following rules or something like that. It's about this love that we have, our heart attachment to God, being expressed. That's the ultimate reality, being expressed then in our words, in our actions, in our faith, in our obedience to God. So it's demonstrated in our obedience. And it's interesting. Go ahead and put up these next verses. Listen to these. Uh, here's three different verses that are in there. If you love me, keep my commands. So Jesus says, hey, if, if you, you say you love me, okay, well, let, let, kind of let's see it. Then verse 21, whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. He says, I, I can tell if you actually love me because you're doing what I say. Verse 23 and 24, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. The Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teaching. So th there's this connection between, hey, if we, don't, if we don't love him, of course we're not going to do what he says. But if we say we love him, then why wouldn't we try to live our life like he's in charge? Now, that's, that's part of what he's getting at. Uh, so that's the starting point, this love allegiance, a love allegiance that we are committed to. We know that God is committed to our good. So we say, God, let's begin to act like I know that you love me. And it just can't help but come out that way. But what scripture tells us is that this tragedy that happened in the Garden of Eden with this first couple who disobeyed God, it wasn't just that they broke a rule. The big problem is actually that their hearts broke allegiance with God. They said, hey, I, I can't trust you to want what's best for me. I get to choose what's best for me, and I am going to listen to somebody else instead of to you, God. That's ultimately what ended up happening. And, and if we follow the story of what happens in Scripture is at, from that break, that's where everything starts to break apart. That, that action was really destructive to their relationship with each other, to their relationship with God, even to humans' relationship with the world. And creation starts to look broken. And our, our hearts, what we see from that part going forward is that our hearts naturally seek to lean away from God, that we, that we seek some other authority, whether it's us or something else other than God. We want something else, and we seek the wrong authority for that. So it's really helpful for us to say we, we can recognize that Christianity is not, it's not supposed to be a list of rules for us because the rules won't fix the heart problem. God did give law to his people, but the reason for giving the law wasn't to just fix them. It was actually, it was to guide them, but it was also to point out that the people couldn't end up doing it all. That was part, that's what scripture says, is that it was supposed to show us that we couldn't do it all, that it actually ultimately wasn't about this list of rules that we were supposed to have. It's supposed to point to this internal problem that we've got, that our hearts are not allied completely with God, and we can't seem to fix it on our own. But God's project in this broken world was to enter in and to change that, that, that he was supposed to end up shaping us, shape us, shape us. I can speak English. I really can. Uh, so, uh, but it makes sense, though, that if our, if our hearts are not connected to God, if we're not seeking to obey him, that, it, that we actually ultimately don't love him. If we don't even want to love him, of course we're not going to seek to follow him in obedience. So love and obedience are connected, intertwined. There's a theologian, Leslie Newbegin, 
uh, I, I appreciate what he says this. He says this, contemporary Christian thinking tends to avoid the category of obedience and to speak only of love. That is the way of illusion. Obedience is the test of love. Love is the content of obedience. That, it's, that it, we actually are showing that we do actually ultimately love God. And, and it's, it's, it's helpful for us. You know, these two things can't be separated. If, you, if we love but don't obey God, it ends up just being kind of airy, fluffy nothingness, right? But if we obey without any kind of love, heart connection, then it's more of a kind of a slave mentality that we would say, oh, I guess I just have to do this thing for God and he doesn't care about me. I don't really care. We're just trying to take care of business here. John, he repeats this thing. I, I want to tell you, it's not just here in this gospel. The, this writer, this apostle John, used this same thing in, one of his, in a couple of his letters. But one is very striking. It's in 1 John 5, 2 and 3. He says this. This is how we know that we, that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God. He, can, he says it very straight. To keep his commands. Which is striking because this, this Apostle John, we know him as, this, as the disciple who Jesus loved. The, he talks so much about love in his letters. And for him to say that very clearly, like this is a part of our love for him. That it's about this heart connection, this heart attachment, allegiance to God. And what our passage tells us, though, what's amazing is... It actually does bear fruit for us. And what we're looking for is that it brings us into intimacy with God. The result is that we are brought into intimacy with God. And that this payoff is actually, it starts to sound really uh, bigger. I think if we spent more time thinking about this, this seems even bigger than what we might think at first glance. It sounds to me like what Jesus is saying is that we as believers actually get invited into the intimacy of the Trinity, that we are invited into this relationship between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Listen to uh, verses 20 and 21. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, so Christ is in the Father, and you are in me, so therefore we are in the Father as well, and I am in you. It's this kind of enfolding different in each in the other. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and will show myself to them. So there's, a, there's an element where we are shown God. I think that that's the presence of the Spirit in us brings this Father and Son into us, that we will be loved. And in verse 23, it says this, My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. If you've, if you've ever heard language about Christ dwelling in you or that, uh, that uh, there was a book even written years ago, My Heart, Christ's Home, that comes from this verse here, that, that God's home is in us, which is really striking. We, we tend to think about ourselves coming to God, but what we have here is a picture of, of God's intimacy with us, of God coming to us, to dwell in us. And I, sometimes, as Christians, we can almost be a little too familiar with this idea. This should blow our minds. This would, I, I, I think some of you who have been here for some time, you know that I spent um, years working with Muslim students. This would really freak out Muslim students, um, this whole idea, uh, that, that God would abase himself enough to be with us, that God would even think about us in that way is really striking. But it's this connection with God that we would belong to God and God belongs to us in some way. And, but it's, it's not just lovey-dovey, but it is this cycle of love and obedience together. And I think a lot of times in the West, what we are looking for when we talk about being freed, we think of freedom from. Freedom from obligations, freedom from other people who could tell us what to do, freedom from any of those kinds of things, any kind of presupposed ideas that other people have on us. But there's a difference between the freedom of hell, which is just freedom from anybody telling you what to do, and the freedom of heaven, which is what Christ has come to bring us. Real belonging, real opportunity to be ourselves in a new way, real connection with the Father and our identity being solidified 
in this loving relationship with the Trinity. So that is what we are released to do, that we are invited into this intimacy. The last is that we are marked. The reason why, why would we love like this? Why would we obey? Why would we do that? Is because as Christians, we have been marked by costly love. We have been marked by costly love. And I want to be really clear that we do not gain God's love by obeying him or by, by doing things for God. You can't earn God's love. And, and besides the fact that it, in Scripture it says that we love because God first loved us. But the way that we, one of the ways that we can love God is actually by obeying him, that we would give in to him, that we were able to say, you are Lord, I am not. I want to do what you have to say. We give God back through obedience and because we've been cr- marked by costly love. That, that this Christ who's speaking here in chapter 14 is the same one who is going to go and give his life for these disciples, for everyone who would follow after him. He's the one who was willing to go to the cross and die for our sins. It's, this is the, the cost of love was Christ's own life, that he was willing to go and take our place and to be forsaken for us, that we would be people who could then love God. It frees us up to love. So we, uh, the beginning of this where God, we love because God first loved us, he, the way he loved us was this costly love that he gave himself for us. And there's going to be, in the, in the time ahead, one of the things that Jesus is trying to do is to prepare these people who are there in the room with them, to prepare them for some difficulties that are up ahead. They're going to face some times when people are going to reject them, who aren't going to love the message that they come to bring. And I want to tell you, there is going to be a cost for you as well if you want to follow Jesus. Sometimes we get in this mentality that we think, I want good things that God comes to bring for me, but I just want to stay the same as I always have been. I, I, what I want is to be me, but kind of like a little bit spiritual me, maybe, something like that. Uh, but what God is saying is, I'm coming to you to revolutionize things, to change your life around, to, to have you shape your life around me. And what that's going to do is to give us a new freedom. It's not a new, uh, we are not new slaves, although uh, we are talked about as being servants of God, but servants who have been set free as God's friends. And we're, gonna, we're actually going to talk about that in, in two weeks. Uh, we're going to talk about being God's friends, and that's going to be in John 15. So there is, it's going to be difficult for us if you want to follow and love Jesus. There, there are, there's a competition for our attention in the world. Uh, there are cultural pressures for us to do certain things or to act in certain ways. Uh, we recognize that we have our own desires to protect our ego, to uh, just be comfortable, maybe, that we'll fight against this idea of being faithful, to be uh, actually listening to Christ as Lord. And, and the funny part is, actually, I kind of don't really need to convince you of that. <laughs> but if you have been a follower of Jesus for some time, you've experienced some of those things. You, we said last week that the Spirit is supposed to direct us toward Christ. You have probably experienced that. If you are, are a new believer, maybe you have experienced God pushing you toward Christ. If you're, if, even if you are investigating today, maybe you have experienced this idea of an awakening spiritually. And that is God's Spirit working in you, pushing you toward God. Uh, if you have been a follower of Jesus for a while, you maybe have experienced some of this revolution in your life too. Uh, you've seen the slow or fast work of the Spirit in your life, shaping you to look like Jesus, or maybe fighting against you so that you will look like Jesus. Uh, this shaping of our souls so that we will be more Christ-like. Uh, I think if we took an anonymous poll of people who are here I think you'd be able to tell me stories of ways that God has been working in you to shape you, to live in sacrificial love with somebody who is difficult. Or maybe um, you have disciplined yourself in thanksgiving to thank God in hard circumstances. You, you've been faithful even during times of spiritual drought. You didn't feel like it, but you kept on. Uh, 
Uh, maybe you give sacrificially of your time or your money, your attention. You, you have cared for other people around you in some way. Uh, you have maybe experienced painful forgiveness for God's sake. You said, I will forgive you because of Jesus. So you have seen those things, and I hope, I hope that you have seen some of the spiritual blessings of those things, this intimacy with God that I've said before, that as you make these sacrifices or as you adapt your life to God, that you begin to experience God's blessing in that as well, that we feel this connection to God. It, it, it magnifies our worship of God, that we're able to see God as being truly who he is. Uh, we're able to, to trust God in new ways. Maybe, maybe because we took a small step in this place, we said, okay, well, I, I guess I can try that out, God. That maybe God will call you into something else. You say, I feel like I can trust you for something more. We begin to surrender to God, giving up, uh, maybe giving up some of your time for someone else who is nearby. I, I feel like one of the ways that we're going to apply this, as I think about this, it, it can definitely be an individual thing between us and God, but I feel like even from the context of John and some of his letters, and just from our daily experience, one of the best ways for us to apply this, for us to, to live into obeying God, is God to end up looking like us interacting with other people around us. It's going to affect the relationships of the people who are closest to us. That, that God's Work in us is going to end up shaping the way that we act, the way that we speak to other people who are near us. It's going to shape us in those things. And you know what? I want to tell you, this is the best thing for us. God knows you. God knows your circumstances and the things that you're facing, and he knows what's best for you as well. And it's, it's shocking that we sometimes think that I know what's best for me. But God knows what is best for us. That we, as Christians, are recognizing that God is the one who would know what is good for me, and he's going to be able to give it. In fact, God is send, telling us to do what we would actually tell ourselves to do if we knew everything in the universe. If we knew everything there was to know about ourselves and the world, the things that God is telling us to do, are actually the exact same things that we would tell ourselves to do, that we can live into that. We're going to have more peace and more rest in the Holy Spirit if we live into this. So I want to tell you, part of your faith journey, wherever you are in your faith journey, is going to be a step of obedience. It's recognizing that we need to live into that. And, uh, you know, sometimes we think of it as uh, maybe stopping doing certain things, of course, uh, ways that we want to obey God, but I, I want to say maybe some of it is also, uh, when, we, when we confess our sins, one of the things we confess is we confess the things that we have done and the things that we have left undone. Uh, maybe there is a, something that's missing in our life as far as a, an act of love or giving of a certain amount of patience in a moment that would be some way that we would be able to live into obeying God. So I, I'm going to give us a moment to pray in just, just a second. I'm going to have us pray. And I, I want you to begin to start wondering, uh, interacting not with me, but with God. There in your seat to say, God, what would it mean for me to obey you today? What's one way that you are asking me to obey? And, and, and we have to be honest that we like control of our own lives. We want to be in control of our own lives. But we can ask, as we start to wonder about this, we think, oh no, if I, if I pray that thing, is God going to make me uncomfortable? Is God going to make things hard for me? Am I going to have to give up something that I like? Am I going to have to do something that I don't like to do? We can say, Jesus, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid of what you're going to call me into. And maybe we can say, hey, you know what, I don't, I don't want to be seen as being like some kind of fanatic or weird. Maybe that's real. We don't want to be like that. But we can still ask, acknowledging some of the hesitations that are in our heart. I would like for us to take a moment in silent prayer. I'm not going to ask you to pray with anyone next to you or to say it out to me. I want you to ask in silent prayer to ask, ask Jesus, how are you inviting me to surrender to you? How are you inviting me to surrender to you, and where are you calling me to obey your commands? I'm going I'm to give you a few moments in silence for you to interact directly with God. Take a moment.
continuing in prayer, go ahead and go to the next slide. I want you to continue in prayer and, and pray this. Tell the Holy Spirit, tell the Lord, if you are willing to take that step of obedience that God is maybe asking you to do. And if you're worried or you're not really willing to go there yet, is there fear there? So take a moment. Are you actually willing to take that step that God is calling you to? And if not, kind of why? Lord, I pray for you to give us courage to do the things that you ask us to do, to step into this life that you are calling us to. I pray that you'll give us boldness and courage today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You know, it's not very easy to think about doing that stuff, but I will tell you, it is going to pay benefits. It's going to pay dividends for us. We are going to grow in intimacy with God as we begin to trust in him. Maybe as I'm speaking, you have thought about other words of songs. You thought about maybe the word trust and obey. Uh, there's, for there's no other way, right, to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Uh, we think about that one. All right, but you know, the other song that I thought of this week is for us is that it's sweet to trust in Jesus. And I am not a great singer, but I would like for us to sing a little bit of this. If you sing with me, um, yeah, I should have just asked Jay to help me with this. I, I should have. Yeah, give, can you help, help give me a key to start off with? Is that okay? Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to. How sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, and in simple faith to plunge me neath the healing cleansing blood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, for grace to trust him more. I want to tell you, we need the grace of God to trust him, but I want to tell you, it is worth it. It is worth it for you to trust Jesus today. There's nothing better out there for you to trust in yourself. I know myself, and I'm going to fail myself. And if I trust in other people, they're going to fail me at times. But God doesn't fail you. God wants good things for you. And it is worth it for you to take a step to trust him a little bit more today. So let's do that. Amen. Worship team, come on back up. Let's continue to lead us in worship. <laughs>